So today we're going to talk about um, racial disparities. So we've touched on race issues many times in this class in different contexts. And now I just want to hone in on that uh, directly as a topic that people have thought about a lot over the years and talk about how we're studying those issues with uh, modern data. So just to set the stage, some statistics that you will all be familiar with just from day-to-day -day life. There are very sharp differences in economic outcomes and a variety of other outcomes by race and ethnicity in the United States. So to take one example, if you look at median household incomes in 2016, 63,000 for white Americans, 38,000 for black Americans, 80,000 for Asians, 46,000 for Hispanic Americans, and about $40,000 for uh, Native Americans. So really sharp differences by race and ethnicity that have persisted for many, many generations uh, in the United States um, and have attracted, therefore, a tremendous amount of attention in social science from economists, sociologists, psychologists, folks here at Harvard, elsewhere, um, over decades trying to understand why we have these persistent racial disparities. And I'm not going to go through this in great detail, but this is just to give you a sense of this is a topic that has been studied for a very long time, and people have proposed all kinds of different theories, ranging from family-level factors, so differences in parental income or parental wealth or education, or differences in family structure. So for example, uh, black kids are much more likely to grow up in single-parent families than white kids are. Does that have a role to play? There are lots of theories. Probably the most prominent set of theories are the structural features of the environment. So people focus a lot on issues like segregation. So famously, William Julius Wilson here at Harvard has some really influential work arguing that the segregation of American cities by race is very detrimental um, for, for black kids. And in particular, being isolated from where the good jobs are might be very problematic for black Americans. There are lots of work uh, talking about differences in school quality that black and white kids um, experience, of course, a lot of discussion of discrimination in the labor market and the criminal justice system. And then more in the sociology and psychology literature, a uh, set of work on cultural factors and social norms, so issues of identity, uh, oppositional norms, aspirations, role models, how that might play out differently by race and ethnicity. So you know, you could have a whole class, and there are whole classes entirely devoted to this body of work. I'm going to do, um, I'm not going to you know, go into that in any detail at all. Instead, what I'm going to do is talk about recent work that takes a different angle on thinking about some of these issues and I think illustrates the power of new data in making po progress on age-old problems that people have been thinking about and allows us to evaluate some of the various theories that have been put forth that I quickly listed on that previous slide. So the key point of departure for the way we are going to talk about this in this particular lecture uh, is recognizing that most of the prior work on racial disparities that has been done uh, studies disparities within a single generation. So if you think about like that first slide that I showed you, average incomes in 2016, that's just a snapshot for people at a given point in time. And so then there's a lot of work asking, you know, is this about discrimination among uh, black versus white adults? Is it about other factors that affect people at a point in time? What we're going to do here, which builds a bit on the types of stuff we've been talking about in the first half of this course, is to take an intergenerational perspective, focusing on the dynamics of income across generations. So rather than looking at a point in time, looking at what children's chances of climbing up or down the income ladder are based on their race and ethnicity. Now, we're doing that not just because you know, now we have the data to do intergenerational stuff, and why don't we just do that again by race, but rather because, as you will see, the intergenerational approach, I think, sheds light on which types of disparities are likely to persist in the long run and allows us to isolate exactly which factors drive the persistence of these gaps. So rather than, I think the key feature of racial gaps, in my view, is not that they happen to occur at a point in time, but rather that if you look over the historical record over the past 50, 60 years or 100 years, you would see, and you looked at just average incomes, you would see a chart that looked very much like the chart I started out this lecture with. So there's something about this that's extremely persistent over time 
And what I'll show you is that taking this intergenerational lens of looking at people climbing up and down the income ladder um, can help us understand why that's the case and you know, when that's likely to occur, how we might change it, and so forth. So methodologically, the concepts that we're going to cover in today's lecture are analysis of dynamics of income, or those of you who have taken more advanced statistics classes, this would be like stochastic processes, a very simple version of that that we're going to talk about. Um, and then the idea of steady states. So if you have a system that's kind of uh, going forward over time and there's certain dynamics in it, where is it going to converge? Where is it going to reach like a resting state? And so we'll talk about that uh, in a very simple way in the context of this application, but those types of methods are, are useful more generally. Okay, so I'll start with this chart, which is familiar to you, um, which we looked at in a very early lecture, which just looks at intergenerational mobility in the United States as a whole. So to refresh your memory, what we're plotting here is the average income percentile of kids versus their parents' income percentile, 100 dots here, showing the average income percentile within each of the parental income percentiles. So we see a strong upward sloping relationship here. Kids born to richer parents end up having higher incomes themselves on average, as we've seen before. Um, that slope looks roughly linear, and it's uh, about um, a slope of 0.35, meaning that there's about a 35 percentile point difference in terms of where kids born to the highest income families end up on average in the income distribution versus kids born to the lowest income families. So before in everything we've done, we've just been looking at that data pooling races and ethnicities. What we're going to focus on in this class is uh, breaking up that data by race and ethnicity. But before I show you what that looks like in the data, it's useful to understand from a conceptual point of view why this relationship matters for thinking about the evolution of racial disparities by working through the following exercise on the dynamics of income. So the way I'm going to work through this is first start out by thinking about where black and white Americans are at present. So if we take our data and we look at the average income rank of white parents in our data, so this is the same data that we've worked with a bunch of times in this class, kids born in the 1980s using the tax record, census records, and so forth, we see that the average uh, white parent rank is 57.9. That is the average white kid is growing up in a household at roughly the 58th percentile of the income distribution. The average black kid is currently growing up in a family at roughly the 33rd percentile of the income distribution. So that's just a different way to say that there's a big gap in average incomes by race. We see that in our data as we saw in the statistics that I started out with. So what I want to do now is ask, this is the gap that we see in the current generation. Suppose hypothetically that both black and white Americans faced exactly the same intergenerational mobility curve that's plotted in black there. What that intergenerational mobility curve allows you to do is to then make a prediction about what is going to happen uh, in the next generation to average incomes. So in particular, the average black kid is growing up in a family at the 33rd percentile. If you just read off of that line, what that's telling you is kids at the 33rd percentile, on average, we see that they end up at the 448 percentile themselves in the next generation. That's what we see in the data, OK? And so here, importantly, I'm making the assumption that that black line holds for both blacks and whites. I'm going to come back to assess whether that's the case in the data in a second. But let's run with that assumption for a moment. We would see that if both black and white kids had the same intergenerational mobility relationship, black kids would end up at the 44th percentile on average in the next generation, and white kids would end up at the 54th percentile. You can just read it off of where this line is, all right? And so you can see that initially, in the parents' generation in this example, you have a gap of 25 percentiles between black and white kids. But then in the next generation, that gap shrinks down to 8.8 .8 percentiles if they both have the same intergenerational mobility curve. So what's the reason for that? Because you don't have perfect persistence of income across generations, you have some mobility upward for kids born to low-income families and some downward mobility for kids born to higher-income families, the gap is naturally going to shrink over time if blacks and whites 
have the same rates of intergenerational mobility, okay? And in particular, what you can show mathematically is that the gap is gonna shrink by the, in proportion to the slope of this relationship. So the slope of this relationship was 0.35, and so 8.8 .8 is 0.35 times 25.2. That's basically where you're ending up, okay? Each generation, the gap is gonna shrink to about one third of what it originally was. Now that's a very powerful dynamic force because it compounds over generations. So if we run this forward one more generation, so imagine now we're looking at the grandkids. They're starting out in, with a gap of 8.8, .8. do the same exercise. The predicted gap in generation two now shrinks down to just 3.1, okay? So what that says is within two generations, if rates of intergenerational mobility were the same for blacks and whites, the gap would shrink from 25, very large, down to 8.8, .8, down to 3.1. And so the, the fundamental lesson that you see there, which you can prove much more generally than the simple example I'm, I'm giving you, is that if intergenerational mobility does not vary across groups, then racial disparities would shrink extremely rapidly across generations, okay? They would shrink at an exponential rate, basically. And so why does that matter? What it says is, you know, if we get to a point where, it shows you why intergenerational mobility is fundamental. If intergenerational mobility were equated across racial and ethnic groups, within a couple of generations, the black-white gap would disappear, just through the standard evolution of income uh, that you see, you know, standard rates of mobility. So that's a, a powerful result established by a famous economist, Gary Becker, at the University of Chicago, um, that I think has, you know, at least provides a useful benchmark in thinking about why these things matter. So now, in fact, here we've just made the assumption that that intergenerational mobility curve looks the same for blacks and whites. So now let's look at what it actually looks like in the data. And so when you actually look at the data, you see that in fact rates of intergenerational mobility are not the same for blacks and whites. They're quite different. So now what we're doing here is plotting that same curve but actually looking at the data and splitting it out separately for whites and blue and blacks in the red triangles. And what you see here, I think, is a, a striking and to us quite surprising pattern. So first, notice that this basically, so the curve is clearly not the same for both. There's a gap of about 12.6 percentiles if you look at the 25th percentile, for example. So in other words, black kids born to families at the 25th percentile of the income distribution end up 12.6 percentiles points lower in the income distribution than white kids growing up in families with comparable income. So there's a huge gap in terms of rates of upward mobility for kids growing up in low-income families by race. What surprised us more is that, you know, we had some sense that rates of mobility might not be the same by race. What, at least I had the intuition going into this work, that if you were sufficiently rich race you know, might not matter anymore. So if, for instance, you were in the top 1%, you know, I had the intuition that maybe at that point racial disparities would become less important. But what you can see is that is actually totally wrong. The gap is almost exactly the same at the 75th percentile and even the 99th percentile as what it is at the 25th percentile. So black kids growing up to the highest income families, growing up in the highest income families in the US still have um, significantly lower incomes in adulthood than white kids growing up in very affluent families. So what that tells you is that it's not just that black kids have lower rates of upward mobility than white kids, as you see at the bottom, they also have much higher rates of downward mobility than white kids. You grow up in a high income family, you're much more likely to move down than white kids are. Now, this 12 percentile point difference, it's a little bit hard to get a sense of, you know, how big is that magnitude? Is that really a big difference? So a different way to see the downward mobility pattern, which is a data visualization that the New York Times put together using our data, is this chart here, which shows you income mobility for black versus white kids growing up in high income families. So the way this is constructed is, you take a set of kids who grew up in families in the top fifth of the income distribution, and you ask in which fifth of the income distribution did they themselves end up in adulthood, okay? The lowest fifth uh, up to the top fifth. The purple dots are for black kids. 
The green dots are for white kids. And you see what I think is a really disturbing pattern about America, which is if you look at the purple dots, they tend to cascade towards the bottom. So even if you grew up in a high-income family, you have a tremendously high chance of ending up even you know, in the bottom fifth or certainly in the lower middle class. Whereas if, uh, for white kids, if you grew up in an affluent family, you see the green dots kind of float directly to the right. You tend to stay high income if you were born into a high income family. So this is, you know, I think, a more visually compelling way of seeing the thing that I was saying in the previous slide, which is that there's a lot more downward mobility for black Americans than there is for white Americans. Now, why is that so important? So the way I think about it kind of visually is if you think of achieving the American dream as climbing an income ladder for white Americans, it's more like being on a treadmill for black Americans, right? So even after you climb up in one generation and escape poverty, unfortunately, there's tremendous downward pressure on income such that you have a very high probability of falling back down into the middle class with lower class and then kind of have to make that climb again. Okay, and so that difference in terms of rates of mobility I think is fundamental in understanding why you have uh, these, these very big, these very persistent uh, gaps, gaps in income, these very persistent disparities. And so just to show you how that plays out, mathematically, what you can do is come back to these two charts here, and you can construct what we call the steady state. So what the steady state means is if I'm running through this process where every year I have a set of incomes that are realized. Then you have this intergenerational mobility process described by this curve. Now you have a set of incomes in the next generation. And then you can ask, OK, for the grandkids, what are their average incomes going to look like? And then the great grandkids, and so forth, generation after generation. What you can show is that if that slope, of, if the slope of that relationship is below 1, that process is going to converge to an equilibrium where the previous generation and the next generation are going to have the same income. So that's what economists call the steady state of the system. It's the kind of the stable point, an analogy to like uh, physics. You know, if you have a dynamic system, it's going to converge to a certain equilibrium. And so the way you can read that off in a very simple way in this diagram is it's basically where these lines intersect the 45 degree line. It's the point at which the parent's income if you read off what that's going to imply for the average kid income, it's going to be the same, right? It's the point at which uh, you, you see the x and y values here at 54.4. If you were to start out at 54.4, you end up at 54.4 as well. And so then if you just think generation after generation, once you're at 54.4, you're not going to move away from that. Okay, So that's the steady state uh, prediction for whites based on this intergenerational mobility curve. If you look now at the steady state prediction for blacks, given the significantly lower rates of upward mobility and higher rates of downward mobility, the steady state prediction is just 35.2. Okay, so considerably lower than we saw for whites. And in particular, uh, what you can see is that the um, steady state gap which is 19.2 percentiles, the difference between 54.4 and 35.2, is roughly equal to the current gap that we actually see between blacks and whites, which is about 21 percentiles, all right? So the, the key lesson you get out of this is in the actual data, contrary to the hypothetical example that I started out with, there's a big difference in rates of intergenerational mobility between blacks and whites. And the consequence of that is that these racial disparities are going to persist in steady state. The, the fundamental reason that you have persistent black-white gaps in the US over hundreds of years is because you have different rates of intergenerational mobility. As you saw in the initial example I gave, if that were not true, those gaps would naturally shrink over time. But in, in practice, there are big differences in intergenerational mobility. In fact, those differences are so large that the gap that you'd end up having in steady state, if you just think about it from the lens of the simple dynamic model, the gap you'd have is about 20 percentiles, which is, in fact, the gap we actually have today. So what is that telling you? Uh, it's telling you that the intergenerational gaps that we see in the data, um, sorry, the, the, the gaps in income that we see in the data between blacks and whites, uh, 
are driven by uh, these differences in rates of mobility rather than transitory factors that might vanish over time. So, you know, one potential set of explanations for why black Americans have lower rates of income than white Americans is that, you know, perhaps there's just something that's happened in terms of the set of jobs black Americans tend to have or the places they tend to live where they've had a negative shock and maybe that's gonna fade over time. A different explanation is that they just persistently have lower rates of mobility and that's gonna create you know, persistent disparities. And if you look at the data, it more, looks more consistent with the latter view. That is, in order to really have an impact on racial disparities in the long run in the US, you have to fix the mobility issue. You have to, in a sense, fix that treadmill, change rates of mobility for black Americans. That's the only way you're gonna have a persistent impact. If you just do something like transfer incomes to black Americans in the current generation, or you try to provide temporary jobs or something like that. You do something that just has a transitory impact for one generation without fixing the treadmill, it's not going to have a persistent effect in the long run. So what you can see from this is intergenerational mobility really seems fundamental in understanding why we have persistent racial disparities in the US. OK, so any questions what I've just covered here? Yes, so it's the same exact data that we've talked about for some of the other work, the Opportunity Atlas, et cetera. It's actually literally the same sample. We're just cutting that by race. And so, you know, that's kids born in the 1980s. We're measuring their incomes around 2015 when they're in their early 30s uh, using the full population and so forth. So it's basically that group. You could, as I've talked about earlier, you know, you could potentially extend that to earlier periods if you collect more data. We've done some work looking at more recent birth cohorts, and we find it's pretty stable, these gaps, over the cohorts we're able to look at, which is very consistent with the point that I'm making here, that it seems to be in steady state, right? That we're not seeing significant uh, changes in the magnitude of the black-white gap. Uh, very consistent with these ideas. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm going to get to that, and that's going to shed some light on what might be driving this. Yep. Yeah. Yes. So, and I'm going to come to that as well. So that's a key part of what's going on. So just to repeat, one in three black men have, have been incarcerated at, at, uh, at some point. Uh, that obviously has a huge impact mechanically on your income at a given point in time and down the road. Um, and they are included. So the power of these data is you're including everyone basically who has a valid SSN. Uh, and so if you're incarcerated, you're going to show up as having basically zero income in our data. You're, you're not going to be excluded. And that's crucial in understanding what's going on. Others, any questions on the methods? Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So we're going to talk about some potential explanations, you know, test in the data as best we can, various potential explanations. You know, why did I come in with that prior? It's not so much that I thought there would be zero gap at the top. I guess I had expected, and you know, you might have a different view, but, and certainly the data rejected, the, 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 clearly rejects the view I had. But, uh, you know, I just thought there would be some convergence at the top, right? So that at, it, perhaps at some point, racial disparities uh, would, would, would become less important. Certainly, you know, when you talk to the average person kind of working on these issues, a lot of people have the intuition that, oh, you know, the, in, in my school, in my affluent suburb, surely there are no disparities in terms of, uh, you know, the outcomes that um, kids have, et cetera. Uh, and that, that's, that's just not true. And we'll talk about that, you know, even cutting the data across specific areas. We're going to see that this persists quite a bit. But um, yeah, and I, I, you know, is it about uh, discrimination? Is it about other factors? I'll get into that a little bit as we, as we go through various explanations. Anybody else? OK, great. All right, so I was focusing on the white-black disparity. That's the one that people have paid the most attention to at some level because of its scale and significance in, in US history.
I want to show you the data for other races and ethnicities before uh, moving on to potential explanations. So here's the same intergenerational mobility relationship for Native Americans or American Indians, uh, where you see it looks almost identical to the relationship for, for black Americans. Um, here's the relationship for Hispanic Americans. Uh, and um, what I think is interesting about the relationship for Hispanic Americans is you see it looks considerably closer to what you see for whites than what you see for blacks, right? So it's not identical to what you see for whites, but especially at the low end of the income distribution, you see very similar rates of upward mobility for Hispan Hispanic Americans as you do for white Americans, which means, based on the logic that I was just going through, that over time, and I'll show you this more directly in a second, across generations, Hispanics are gonna catch up to whites to some extent in terms of average incomes in a way that blacks and Native Americans are not because they have persistently lower rates of intergenerational mobility. And then finally, here's the series for Asian uh, Americans. And so here, um, you see that this relationship looks much, much flatter. It's pretty distinct from all of the other relationships that we see in the sense that the line is almost flat, right, for a lot of the region. Your parental income is almost not predictive of your outcomes uh, for Asian kids. And so in particular, at the bottom of the distribution, low-income Asian kids have exceptionally good, uh, exceptionally high uh, incomes. Um, and so in understanding what's going on there, some of you might know that there's been some like qualitative focus on this issue in the past. So in particular, there's a literature that's emerged discussing Asians as sort of a model minority where you see uh, on various dimensions uh, good outcomes for Asian kids, particularly in, in low-income families. But our sense is that is actually kind of a, a misnomer or a, like not the right way to look at it. And the way you can see that is that if you now repeat this chart, but restrict yourself to kids who are not second generation immigrants. So restrict the sample to kids whose moms were born in the United States, okay? You now see that the Asian series looks identical to the series for whites. Uh, so the Asian phenomenon that we see in the previous slide that people have paid some attention to is actually entirely an immigrant phenomenon rather than an Asian phenomenon. It's about Asian immigrants whose parents end up having low incomes. So like the canonical example you'd hear about is a high-skilled person coming from other countries, so like an engineer who you know, ends up taking a, a lower-paying job in order to come to the United States, but they still kind of have a high level of education to begin with, and so then maybe their kids end up doing quite well. That's gonna make the line look very flat when you include immigrants for Asians. But when you leave out uh, parents who are immigrants, you see that there's nothing fundamentally different about rates of mobility for Asian kids relative to white kids, et cetera. They all look relative to, relatively similar to each other. What, what is, I think, quite persistent, robust, and striking is that black and Native American kids have significantly different rates of intergenerational mobility than the other groups. And so the consequence of that uh, is illustrated in this chart, which kind of summarizes where we think these various groups are going to end up over time, given this intergenerational mobility process. So what we're doing here is plotting the predicted steady state for each of these groups. So basically take the lines that I was showing you on the previous slides, look at where they intersect the 45 degree line. So what is the point where the parents' average income will equal the kids' average income? So for instance, you know, you can see whites are up around the 54th percentile, blacks are down around the 35th percentile as we saw before, et cetera. So that's what's on the x-axis. On the y-axis, we're showing what you actually see in the data for the parents' generation. So these are the parents of the kids in our sample, and then for the kids themselves when they're in their mid-30s. And the kids here are kids born between 1978 and 1983. So this is like one generation ago is the circles, and then the diamonds, you can think of that as like the current generation of 30-year-olds in the US. Um, and so you can see that for black parents and black kids, there's very little delta there. 
And in particular, they're very close to the 45 degree line. That is, they're very close to the steady state for blacks. So that's the point that I've been making, that blacks, given their rates of intergenerational mobility, they have a low steady state income. And in practice, in the data, they're very close to that steady state. Similarly, for Native Americans, um, for, you know, for American Indians, like the, the parents, the kids, and the steady state, they're all on top of each other. You're right on the 45 degree line of this chart, OK? In contrast, if you look at Hispanic Americans, as I was saying earlier, Hispanic, in the parents' generation, Hispanic Americans, they have similar incomes to black Americans. So both Hispanics and blacks, you know, you see relatively high rates of poverty, relatively low incomes. But Hispanics, as you can see, are on a dramatically different trajectory relative to black Americans across generations. You see that the kids are doing much better than the parents in terms of average incomes. And then we predict, based on the intergenerational dynamics, that they're going to end up even higher than that. So even though in the current generation, if you just looked at a snapshot, you would not think of those two groups as having you know, dramatically different economic situations, they're on very different paths across generations. And so you know, the types of solutions you might think about in the context of thinking about inequality and disparities between Hispanics and whites, I think, are very different than the types of issues you'd think about between blacks or Native Americans and whites. Uh, and then finally, coming to whites and Asians, you see that they're also very close to their steady states. And in particular, Asians, while they currently have much higher incomes than whites, because again, their intergenerational mobility looks pretty similar to whites, we think they're going to converge to incomes that look pretty similar to whites over time, especially as the immigrant share falls across generations. Question. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so you can basically see that by toggling between these two slides, right? So this includes everyone, all Hispanic kids. This is Hispanic kids with moms born in the US. That one doesn't change a lot. The one that's really changing a lot across those two slides is the Asians. Yeah. Others? Other questions? OK. So. That gives you a big picture view, I think, of how racial disparities are evolving in the US and how these new data, longitudinal data, allow us to understand from a dynamic perspective um, you know, what's going on at kind of a macroeconomic level. So what, what I'm going to do now in the rest of the lecture um, is dig in more into the explanations for what might be driving these racial disparities and start to think a little bit about what one might be able to do from a policy perspective to address these disparities. OK, so as I've just, you know, just to recap quickly, as I've been uh, emphasizing in the first part of this lecture, black Americans are close to their long run steady state, suggests that intergenerational gaps, not transitory factors, drive most of the black white gap today. So, given that, addressing the black white gap is going to require understanding the sources of these intergenerational gaps. Why is it in particular that black kids? earn less than white kids who grow up in families with comparable incomes? That's really the core question if you want to understand how to change these disparities in the long run. Take two kids growing up in a family, same level of income. Why are we seeing different outcomes by race? All right, so the, I'm going to walk through a series of steps in trying to answer that question. So the first step in understanding this, uh, which you touched on with your question about incarceration and, and black men, uh, is to cut the data by gender. So it turns out this is in incredibly important. Um, so looking at men and women separately turns out to be extremely important in understanding what's going on. And when I do that, I'm going to do one change relative to what I was showing you before. Everything I showed you before was household income, including you and your spouse. And what I'm going to show you in the next few slides, we're going to focus on individual income, meaning your own income, excluding your spouse, because that's going to be critical in kind of pulling out these gender disparities. So in particular, I'm going to show you there are much larger gaps for men than women. If I were to look at household income, then that's going to get added into the women's side of sort of the, uh, the ledger. And that uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to mask the, the pattern that I, that I want to show you here. Okay, So we're going to look at own earnings for the kids in the next few slides. Okay, 
So this is the same plot as what I showed you before initially, the racial gaps in intergenerational mobility, uh, for restricting the sample to uh, men, to, to uh, kids who are male, okay? And so we're looking at how male children's incomes in adulthood um, uh, vary with their parent income, and you see a pattern that looks similar to what I showed you before, all right? With gaps of about 10 to 12 percentiles across the income distribution. Here's the same chart for women. So here you see that gap completely vanishes. Black women and white women, conditional on parental income, have basically the same incomes. In fact, it's actually slightly reversed. Black women have slightly higher incomes, conditional on parent income, than white women do, okay? Now, one thing that people sometimes are, are confused by with this chart is they say, are you saying that on average, black women and white women in America have similar incomes, that doesn't sound right. So that is not what we're saying. What we're saying is controlling for your parents' income, black and white women have similar incomes. But you have to remember that on average, because we have racial disparities in the US, white women tend to grow up in much higher income families than black women. So if you just look at the data raw averages, white women end up having higher average incomes than black women because they're growing up in higher income families. But what this is saying is conditional on their parent income. If you take two kids growing up in family earning say $40,000 a year, a black girl and white girl, they end up having pretty similar incomes on average, okay? So it's a different statement. It's a statement about intergenerational mobility. Why does that statement matter? It comes back to what I was saying at the beginning of the lecture. Again, if you wanna understand the evolution of the disparities across generations and the steady states, it's this gap that's going to drive that. Now, it's more complicated in terms of what, where black women's incomes are gonna end up in steady state. You can't conclude from this that black women are gonna end up in steady state with the same average incomes as white women, because of course you have marriage and then household income is gonna matter in the next generation. So the fact that men have lower rates of intergenerational mobility is gonna end up affecting women's incomes in the next generation, so it's a more complex system. But it does show you, I think, these two charts, that that gender disparity is really crucial in understanding what's going on. The black-white gap is heavily driven by what's going on for black men relative to white men. Now, you can see that even more starkly if you look at other outcomes beyond income. So here are employment rates. So just are you working or not? Okay, and so you see, you know, I think a strikingly large gap between black men and white men's employment rates, where you see black men growing up in the lowest income families, only 55% of them are employed in a given year. And there's something like a 20 percentage point gap in employment rates between black and white men growing up in families uh, at like the, 20, at the, at the 25th percentile, okay? So an enormous gap in just the probability of working. If you overlay on that um, black and white women, you see a very different pattern. So there are gender differences in employment rates as is well known. Um, the employment rates for women are, are lower uh, than for men, but if you look at black women and white women, they have extremely similar employment rates, uh, conditional on parental income. In fact, black women have slightly higher rates of employment uh, than, than white women do, okay? And so you see the real sort of outlier here in this series, in this quartet of, of uh, graphs is, uh, is black men, and in particular at the bottom of the income distribution, really falling off. Now, why do black men at the bottom of the income distribution have very low employment rates? I think that's a key thing to, to understand. Part of what is going on is exactly about the criminal justice system and about incarceration. So if you now, instead looking at, of looking at employment, you look at incarceration rates, you see what I think is um, a shocking statistic. So you pointed out that incarceration rates, you know, are very, we know they're very high in general uh, for, for black men. What this is showing you is how that varies with parent income. And so what you can see in the red, if you look at that first triangle there, 21% of black men growing up in the lowest income families in the US 
are incarcerated on a single day, the date of the 2010 census. So this is not incarceration rates over your lifetime. This is whether you're incarcerated on a single day, the date they conducted the 2010 census, which is April 1st, 2010. And 21% of black men raised in lowest income families were incarcerated at that point in time. So if you think about lifetime incidents of incarceration for black men growing up in very uh, low income families, it's you know, astronomically uh, high. And obviously, you know, that's a deep um, social problem. Now, for white men, you see higher incarceration rates at the bottom of the di distribution, but it doesn't kind of rise to anywhere near the same extent as it does for black men. Now, this, as you probably know intuitively, is a very gender-specific phenomenon. If you replicate the same charts for women, that's what you get, right? And so it's not, I mean, there's some uptick at the bottom, but it's obviously just like not at the same scale. It's not the same issue. And so part of, I think, the gender specificity relates to these issues of uh, involvement in crime and the criminal justice system and thinking about that set of issues. Now, I think that's very important, but I also want to be clear that I, I don't think that's the entirety of the explanation. So even if you look at black men who we think have not had contact with the criminal justice system, um, or even before they end up incarcerated, they are on very different paths and you see very big gaps even within that population. So I do think that's a big piece of what's going on, but I, I view it partly as an outcome of various differences that we'll get into in a second about differences in the environments that black kids experience and white kids experience and discrimination and things like that that play out in terms of differences in employment rates and differences in incarceration rather than entirely being the causal effect of incarceration. You should not, I think, read the past two slides as saying this is just all about incarceration. It's not uh, a big enough thing by itself and the gaps persist even independent of that. So questions on this, these gender issues and the set of outcomes? Go ahead. Sorry, yeah, go ahead. Can't see you, but is there somebody back here? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So black uh, immigrants have much, uh, have a profile that looks more like white Americans in terms of rates of intergenerational mobility. Um, you don't see that clearly in the contrast between the two charts that I showed you, because as I'm sure you know, the share of black, just the number of black immigrants relative to the number of black natives is very small. But if you pull out the black immigrants in particular, and you can look at that data in our, um, you, you can look at it online in our, in our paper, you would see an intergenerational mobility profile that looks very similar to what you see for, for white Americans. So there's a big difference there. A further pattern, which I think you know, illuminates some of what is going on and will connect with what I'll talk about in a second, is if you then cut that data by when people came to the United States, um, you see that for most groups, the earlier you come to America, the better you do, right? Which I think, think of US land of opportunity, the earlier you get here, if you got here when you were a kid who was three years old or five years old, on average, you seem to have better outcomes than if you got here when you were 15 years old, for instance, okay? So that's the pattern you see for white immigrants, for Asian immigrants, and so forth. There's one exception to that, and that's for black men. For black men, the earlier you come to America, the worse your outcomes actually look. Uh, and I think that tells you something about the environmental factors that we're gonna talk about in a, in a second that, that drive some of what's going on. Anybody else? Okay, so what's, what's driving the black-white income gap, right? That's obviously the big question here. So one set of factors that people talk a lot about are various, what I think of as kind of family-level factors, things that vary across uh, individual families. So what are those? So we've been looking at differences conditional on income, but there's literature showing that even conditional on income, there are big differences in wealth between black and white families. So 
a white family with an income of $80,000 tends to have much more wealth than black families with an income of $80,000. They're more likely to be homeowners and so forth. So maybe that plays a role. Uh, there are d disparities in education. There are disparities in family structure. So as I was saying earlier, uh, white kids are much more likely to be raised in two-parent families than single-parent families. And so in the interest of time, I'm not going to go into the details of how we control for each of those factors. It's basically simple. We uh, look at a sample of kids who have the same levels of wealth, or we control for differences in parental marital status and so forth. And the bottom line from all of that stuff is very simple. The answer is basically no. Those family level factors do not account for these intergenerational gaps. That is, black men who grow up in two-parent families with comparable income, education, and wealth to white men still fare worse than white men do. So you can take whatever family level factors you're able to measure in the data, put in you know, everything together. That really doesn't seem to explain what's going on. OK, so what then potentially is going on that immediately makes you think of other factors outside the family, uh, environmental factors, in particular environmental factors that might have gender differential effects, which seems really crucial, right? Uh, and so in order to get a sense of what those environmental factors might be, um, uh, what we're going to do is kind of the natural thing you'd think of, given the type of data we're working with, reflecting on the earlier questions. We're going to study the role of environmental factors by analyzing differences in black-white gaps uh, across neighborhoods, all right? Um, and so the way we're going to do that is go back to the geography of upward mobility stuff that we talked about uh, early on in this course. So this is the map that uh, we've seen a few times, just pooling everyone in the nation. So again, just to remind you, what we're showing here, and this is now subset to men. We're going to focus on men for most of the rest of this. Uh, we're looking at the average income in adulthood for men with parents at the 25th percentile of the income distribution. Red colors are places with lower levels of upward mobility. We see big differences across areas and so forth. This is pooling uh, all races and ethnicities. Now what we're going to do is repeat that analysis, splitting the data separately for black men on the left and white men on the right. OK, so this is literally the same statistics we were looking at before, but cut by race. So the first thing to say is when you look at these two maps, you might think or it might look like we've put these two maps on two different color scales, right? It looks like the map on the left is like in a red-yellow color scale, and the map on the right is in a blue-green color scale. But in fact, if you look at the legend at the bottom, you can see that the maps are not on two different color scales. They're on the same color scale. And so the fact that they look completely different like that illustrates, I think, a, a striking fact about racial disparities in the US, which is that the very best places in terms of upward mobility for black men, a place like Boston, for example, where black men growing up in low-income families go on to have average incomes of about $24,000 a year, they have lower rates of upward mobility than the very worst places in terms of upward mobility for white men. So you take a place like Atlanta, for instance, uh, which doesn't look good in terms of upward mobility for white men. The average income for white men growing up there in low-income families is 26000 better than for black men in Boston. So in other words, the distribution of upward mobility across areas for black men is almost non-overlapping with the distribution of upward mobility across areas for white men. So you know, one way to think about it is it's almost like you have two Americas, uh, completely different rates of intergenerational mobility, of upward mobility for white and black men. And so you know, coming back to the question that was asked earlier about how does this vary across places, you know, what you can see is that there is essentially no place in America where you don't have a quite significant black-white disparity in terms of uh, rates of upward mobility. Now, there are still significant differences in terms of rates of upward mobility within the two groups, right? So you see places for black men that have significantly lower incomes uh, relative to others. So if you take Atlanta versus Boston or you know, look, look at some of the contrast there, you can get differences of income about $10,000. And similarly, within white men, you see significant differences. 
but it's clear that these racial disparities are not confined to you know, one particular set of areas. And in particular, if you think about you know, places like Boston, um, you know, the, the East Coast or the Bay Area and so forth, uh, affluent, educated sort of places, racial disparities absolutely persist in those areas contrary to what I think people sometimes uh, think intuitively. It's not that racial disparities persist only in uh, you know, a particular pocket of, uh, of the country, okay? So what we're gonna do next is uh, drill down further into this area level um, variation. So this variation across broad areas um, I think illuminates the broad regional patterns that matter, but it does not directly test for neighborhood effects, right? Because as we've talked about before, we think neighborhoods matter at a much more local level, as you see in the Opportunity Atlas data, than you know, just San Francisco versus Boston and so forth. And that's especially important potentially in the context of race, because if you think about a place like Atlanta, Atlanta is really not the same place for blacks and whites. There's so much segregation within the city of Atlanta that just computing average income in Atlanta for, for kids who grew up in Atlanta for black Americans and white Americans, you wouldn't necessarily think of them as growing up in the same place because in fact they're growing up in two different halves of the city, right? So what we're next gonna do is zoom in to examine variation across census tracts. And so we're basically gonna use the data that you've seen in the Opportunity Atlas, which you can look at by race, and analyze that to try to understand better what might be driving uh, these differences across, um, what might be driving the disparities, okay? So try to find census tracts where you see smaller disparities and ask, you know, what characteristics do they have? And so what I'm gonna do is summarize what we find from that analysis by talking about four key results uh, that, that we have identified. The first is that we find that black boys have lower earnings than white boys in 99% of census tracts in America, controlling for parental income. So there's just a tiny sliver of places where you don't have significant uh, racial disparities. So what are those places? Uh, you know, you can look at this in, in the Opportunity Atlas data, but they're kind of scattered around the U.S. Some examples are places like Silver Spring in Maryland uh, is a place where it turns out black men and white men who grow up there have relatively similar outcomes. There are certain pockets of New York. There are a few other places around the country uh, where you see patterns like that. But by and large, in almost all places in the United States, you see quite significant racial disparities. Question. Would you say that there's any sort of mechanism going on there, or that it's just based on, you know, we have so many places in Africa, it's just bound to be somewhere that's the difference is Yeah, I mean, so say two things on that. I mean, first of all, the 99% statistic is striking, I think, because you would have thought exactly based on your logic. If you're looking across you know, 30,000 tracks or something like that where you have data for blacks and whites, you would have thought, you know, just by chance you'd find a bunch of places where you'd see better outcomes for black kids than white kids. And that just, this shows you how persistent these gaps are, the fact that it's such a tiny sliver where you see something. Now, what I'm gonna do next is talk about what are some of the systematic predictors of the differences in the magnitude of these gaps. Not necessarily focusing just on the 1% of places where we see no gap, but rather, you know, within that 99%, there's some places where the gap is really big. There are other places where the gap is smaller. So there is variation there. And I think we'll be able to learn something systematic from that. And as I'll come back to, I think the 1%, it's not like some random thing. They tend to have certain systematic characteristics that are, that are predictive of these differences. Other questions while here? Okay. So the second point, exactly addressing your question, is that both black and white boys uh, have better outcomes in what you might think of as good neighborhoods, lower poverty places, more expensive neighborhoods, better schools, et cetera. But the black-white gap is actually bigger in such areas. So this echoes a finding that we saw in the work from Sean Reardon looking at test score achievement gaps, 
where we saw that the test score achievement gaps were actually bigger in some of the better school districts in the United States. So you see a similar pattern here. And so let me show you how that plays out. So in this chart, we're correlating a variety of track level characteristics with the incomes of black men and white men who grew up in low income families. The solid circles show you the magnitude of the correlation for white men and the hollow circles show you the magnitude of the correlation for black men. So look at the first line, for example. We can see that the, when you have a larger share of people in your census tract who are above the poverty line, so you have lower poverty rates, you tend to have better outcomes for both black men and for white men. You have a correlation of something like 0.4 with poverty rates, okay? So, you know, simple fact, Black men and white men tend to have better outcomes when they're not growing up in neighborhoods with a lot of concentrated poverty. You see similar patterns if you look at average household incomes, employment rates. Now then, in the next category, if you look at um, characteristics of schools, so math test scores, for example, or you look at measures of educational attainment, you see similar, you know, fairly strong correlations. You also see fairly strong correlations with the share of two-parent families. So we've noticed this before. Before we were breaking down the data by race, there was strong correlation between the fraction of single parents in an area and rates of upward mobility and so forth. So on a lots of these dimensions, you see that a bunch of this variation is fairly predictable. For one interesting thing that, you know, maybe less obvious when you first look at it, but turns out to be quite important, is that notice that the solid circles generally tend to be to the right of the open circles. So the correlations for white men generally tend to be bigger than the correlations for black men. That is, growing up in a lower poverty area is associated with much better outcomes for, for white men, and it's associated with somewhat better outcomes for black men, right? So systematically, you tend to see that various ways of thinking about a better neighborhood in terms of schools, poverty rates, educational attainment, stuff like that. All of that is more associated with better outcomes for white men than it is for black men. And so the consequence of that is if I now plot the black-white gap versus the share of uh, residents above the poverty line, I get an upward sloping relationship that is uh, on the vertical axis here is the gap between white men and black men in terms of their average income rank in adulthood. So seven here means that white men are ending up seven percentile points higher in the income distribution on average than black men. And I'm plotting that gap, this is a bin scatter plot, uh, versus the fraction of people above the poverty line in the relevant census tract. And what you can see here is that there's a um, quite strong upward sloping relationship, meaning that in the places with very high poverty rates, you tend to have a smaller gap between blacks and whites than in the places with lower poverty rates, which are on the right side of the graph. So why is that interesting? Because I think many people have the intuition that perhaps these sorts of disparities, you know, coming back to the question that was asked earlier, in the affluent neighborhoods where you're looking at relatively high income families and so forth, racial disparities are actually bigger in those places than in more disadvantaged areas, okay? So it's not that if you're in, you know, parts of Silicon Valley or the affluent suburbs of Boston that these racial disparities become much smaller. In fact, it's the contrary. Racial disparities are particularly large there. Now, to be very clear, that's not to say that it's not better to grow up in those types of areas for kids from these families, right? So remember, both black kids and white kids do better if they're growing up in a place like Newton or Wellesley, the uh, more affluent suburbs of Boston. It's just that white kids gain more, and so the disparity becomes even bigger, right? So we're not saying it's bad to live in one of these nicer neighborhoods, better schools, and so on. It's just that that is not the solution in and of itself for closing um, the, the, the uh, gap, the gaps by race. Okay, questions on this point? 
Okay, so now third point. Okay, so we're interested in identifying places where we see better outcomes for black kids uh, and we see smaller racial disparities, okay? And so what are those kinds of places? So just to provide some context for the type of analysis that we're gonna do here. So if you just wanted to minimize racial disparities, if that was your sole objective, you would actually end up going in kind of a counterintuitive direction. You would look at the places with the highest poverty rates, with the most challenged schools and so forth, where everyone is not doing well, and as a result, you have small racial disparities. So that is actually, you know, if you only cared about racial disparities, one way to close racial disparities would, in principle, be to move in sort of the wrong direction and make everything worse. Obviously, that doesn't make a lot of sense from a social point of view. What you're more interested in is how can you find places that deliver better outcomes for black kids while narrowing the racial disparity, okay? And so we spend some time trying to search for factors that have that property. So one way to think about it is, what are the characteristics of places like Silver Spring in Maryland, which I mentioned before, where you have pretty good outcomes and you have pretty good outcomes for both black and white kids? And so what we found is that within the lower poverty areas where you see relatively good outcomes, as you saw in the, in the previous correlation chart, there are two factors that tend to be associated with better outcomes for black boys and at the same time, smaller gaps. And those two factors are a greater presence of black fathers in the area and lower levels of racial bias. So let me show you how this looks. So um, in this plot, what we're doing is plotting the fraction of um, men who are working, okay, on the y-axis, which is, as you saw, kind of the key dimension for black men, whether you're working or not, there are huge gaps there. Uh, and we're plotting that against the percentage of black children who have a dad present in the census tract. So think of it as basically the fraction of kids who are being raised in two-parent households. And you can see here that if you look first at the red triangles, that black men um, who uh, grow up in census tracts where there are lots of fathers present tend to have much higher employment rates than black men who grow up in areas uh, where there are very few fathers present. And why are there very few fathers present? It could be because of issues like incarceration. A number of them are incarcerated. Or actually, mortality rates are so high in this population that you know, it's also partly just about mortality. So on the left side of this chart, think of those as places where there are, in a sense, a lot of missing black men for various structural factors. Uh, and then on the right side, there are more uh, men present, and you see that black men tend to have considerably better outcomes if they're growing up in an area where there are more black fathers present. If you look in contrast at the same plot for white men, the presence of black fathers in an area is essentially not associated at all with the outcomes of white men in the same area. So I think that's interesting because even though this is just a correlational analysis, it suggests that this pattern is not just driven by some broad factor like the places on the right tend to have better schools than the places on the left because if you would have thought that if it's just about better schools, you'd see an impact on the white men's outcomes as well, right? So, so something that's very particular in terms of being associated with the outcomes of black men. Moreover, if you do the same analysis and compare black men to black women, you see uh, a very similar pattern where for black men you see that upward sloping relationship that I showed you before, but black women's employment rates are completely unrelated to the presence of black fathers in an area. Okay, so this echoes a little bit uh, the type of thing that I was showing with the innovation results where it's consistent with the idea that there are exposure effects that are gender and race specific. So when black men grow up in areas with a lot of black men who are around, who have stable jobs, et cetera, maybe that changes the pathways that they choose to pursue in a way that's different from, you know, that has a particular impact on them in a way that it doesn't on black women or doesn't have an impact on white men or women. Now, I don't have the slide here, but interestingly, if you do the same thing for white men and ask, 
how are white men's outcomes associated with the presence of white fathers, you see a very similar pattern. Uh, that is, white men are more likely to be working if they grow up in an area with a lot of white men present. But it's just much less important because most white kids are growing up in areas where lots of white fathers are present. Uh, for black men, this is much more of an issue. There's much more variation in the data because of very high incarceration rates for black men, high rates of mortality, and so forth. So this phenomenon is, what, what I'm saying is, this mechanism seems to, it's not race specific. It applies to both blacks and whites. It's just more relevant for black men than it is for white men, okay? So that's one, you know, coming to the question about is it just random places or is there some predictive factor? This is one pattern that is systematic in the data. The other pattern that's systematic in the data is that places uh, with less racial bias tend to have, um, tend to have higher rates of upward mobility for black men. So that might you know, strike you as intuitive. You know, the interesting thing there is how do you measure racial bias in a, in a systematic way? Uh, so this is again where I think modern data can be uh, fairly useful. So we'll talk a little bit more about this in a subsequent lecture about how people use uh, text data to, to measure things like racial animus. One of the indices we use here is a Google search index based uh, measure of racial animus, where you basically look at searches for racial epithets relative to searches for other things and use that as an index for how racially biased people are in, in, a, in a given area. Uh, and you find that places that look like they have more racial animus based on that measure tend to have significantly worse outcomes for black men than they do for white men. Again, none of this stuff proves causality. So I think it's consistent with the idea that racial discrimination plays a role here. It's consistent with the idea that there might be kind of a role modeling, mentoring effect through the black father uh, presence thing that, that seems to matter. But we don't have definitive kind of causal evidence where we've manipulated some, you know, had a program, had a randomized intervention and shown that there are causal effects. But it gives you some sense of the types of factors that might be affecting black men in particular. Okay, fourth and final result from this. Um, we find that neighborhoods, you know, the, the stuff that I was showing you before is just descriptive, just correlational. We find, however, importantly, that these differences across neighborhoods are actually reflecting causal childhood exposure effects. So consistent with we, what we've talked about before, before we started breaking down the data by race, you'll remember we showed with the moving to opportunity study and our analysis, quasi-experimental analysis of kids who moved at different ages, kids who move to better neighborhoods tend to have better outcomes. That turns out to be true by race. So that is black boys who move to areas like Silver Spring where we see good outcomes for black men. If they move there at a younger age, in proportion to the age at which they got there, they tend to have better outcomes. Interestingly, these effects are totally race specific. So in other words, if a black kid moves to a place where white men are doing well, that doesn't necessarily predict better outcomes. If they move to a place where we see black men doing well, they have particularly good outcomes, right? So the black-white gap itself appears to be causally related to childhood exposure. That is, environment really seems to play an important causal role, again, in the context of childhood, not adulthood. Now, why is environment mattering? It could be because of differences across places in terms of uh, mentors, resources, discrimination, and so forth. I don't think we know for sure yet, but it does look like environmental differences are a key factor that explains, uh, uh, explains black-white gaps, okay? So the summary of all this is that you know, what's the kind of the bottom line takeaway? Black boys do well in neighborhoods with good resources, low poverty rates, and good race-specific factors, high father presence, less racial bias, which affects white kids less. So you might then ask, okay, but then how does that explain why we have racial bias, why we have racial uh, gaps almost entirely across America in 99% of census tracts? Why is that the case? The, the problem basically is that it seems like environment matters, but there are basically essentially no neighborhoods in America that provide sort of good environmental conditions uh, for black men to thrive. And the way that you can see that 
is, you know, in a very simple way, asking what fraction of kids grow up in a neighborhood that is both low poverty, so it has good resources, say poverty rate b below 10%, and a high rate of father presence. Let's say more than 50% of the kids are being raised in a household where there's a dad uh, who, who's there. And so you can see that for black kids, 66% of them are being raised in neighborhoods that have low father presence and high rates of poverty. And only 4.2% of them are being raised in kind of the favorable set of conditions, low poverty, high rate of father presence. Now, if you do the same thing for white kids, you see exactly the mirror image. The vast majority of white kids in the US are growing up in uh, low poverty neighborhoods with high rates of father presence. And so if you look at it from that point of view, you know, it makes, it, it's perfectly consistent that environment matters, but it's just that there are a, really a tiny set of places where you have the types of conditions with, you know, be low levels of discrimination, good resources, high rates of father presence, where you don't have serious incarceration issues and so forth that create the conditions where, where black men thrive. So that's our sense of, uh, you know, what seems to be driving these disparities. So let me, in the last couple of minutes, just summarize what I think are the high level conclusions that you should take away from this lecture. So in the first part of this lecture, we saw that mobility into and out of poverty is a central determinant of racial disparities. That is, black kids have much lower rates of upward mobility and greater downward mobility than white kids. That is why we have persistent black-white gaps in America. Second, you know, what that implies is that commonly proposed policies are likely to be insufficient to close the black-white gap uh, by themselves. So for instance, if you think about changes in transfer programs like providing bigger tax credits to certain areas or certain populations or changes in minimum wages, they're unlikely to have a persistent effect on the black-white gap unless they directly change mobility rates across generations. Similarly, reducing residential or school segregation, a lot of what people tend to think about in this space is we just need to make sure that black and white kids are growing up in the same neighborhoods or that they're attending the same school and that's gonna have a big impact on racial disparities. That can potentially help improve the level of outcomes for black kids, but as we saw, within 99% of census tracts in America, even if you've got black and white kids going to the same school, growing up in similar families and so forth, you still continue to have really substantial gaps in outcomes. So just trying to physically get people in the same environments is not enough by itself to address the problem. Instead, I think what we've learned from this is that reducing racial gaps will require policies that cut within neighborhoods and improve environments for specific subgroups, in particular black men. And so what might those programs look like? You know, like with a lot of this other work that I've been showing you, we don't necessarily have the definitive answer yet, but I think some of the correlations that I was showing you toward the end of the lecture point to things like mentoring programs, efforts to reduce racial bias, achieving greater actual ra racial integration within schools, not just having kids going to the same school, but actually interacting with each other, criminal justice reform, and so forth. And I think you know, the key going forward is to further develop and evaluate those types of efforts. So I'll stop there. Thanks.